Uh, but that's what they're doing. You know? I'm dying and creating this, uh, this wave, even though they themselves are not moving, of course. So how does this look on a frequency wave vector plot? I love these four vector diagrams. They, they have everything in them. They have uh, conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. So I'm taking an optical dispersion with this curious uh, curved shape, just, just for illustration. There's also a backward version of it. Um, I, the Raman frequency of the molecules is this dashed line down below. It's the molecular frequency. And this range is around 300 terahertz, typically. So we take some light, the particular frequency, particular wave vector, um, and we can find on that Raman frequency band, which is very flat, of course, um, it's an opti optical phonon band, if you like, we can find a particular point where the combination of wave vector and frequency down here, the combination of wave vector and frequency is just right so that that yellow uh, four vector can, can land you straight on the backward uh, dispersion curve of the backward light. So we have a perfect, so that everything's phase matched, energy is conserved. So that, that's basically what's going on here. So here's the experiment. We first of all generate the seed signal using one length of fiber. So the pulses are from a Nidimim Yag, 12 nanoseconds in duration. Some of the light comes in here. We generate a small Stokes pulse. We filter out the pump and then deliver the, that Stokes pulse at 1134 nanometers to the second system. That's our seed. And here's the second fiber. This is where the backward interaction uh, takes place. The remaining 1064 nanometer is fed into a hydrogen-filled hollow core fiber, and the, the uh, seed pulse is sent in, the weak seed pulse is sent in the backward direction. So we have this interesting situation, pump pulse from one side and a very weak Stokes pulse coming in. So here's the mice, here's the elephant, and they come together. Now, if there wasn't any gas in there, nothing would happen. They just pass through each other. But because there's gas there... <laughs> and uh, you're in resonance with the Raman transition, they, they interact, it's like a great explosion, a kind of very, very intense interaction in which the pump energy is, is transferred to the Stokes, of course, uh, in a very intense uh, and very efficient way. Um, uh, and, and what, in fact, happens, if you look at the equations, what, in fact, happens is that the seed pulse, which in our case started out being 12 nanoseconds long, that's the pulse from the laser, that dotted line is the seed pulse going backwards, this, this, by the way, is time relative to the leading edge of the seed pulse. So we're, we're following what happens following the seed pulse as it goes through, moving with it. This seed pulse is very weak. That's 50 times its actual value, so you'd hardly see it on here if I plotted it. And then as it, 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 as it, it encounters the pump pulse, it, it feels huge amplification. The leading edge particularly gets strongly amplified and, and what you see is, is a, the generation of a, very, of a short pulse, much shorter than the length of the, of the laser pulse coming in, and actually can be much shorter than the Raman coherence length, it turns out. It, it, it ends up actually with very much a soliton shape. It has a set squared profile when you do the calculation. Okay, that's, that's the expression for this, just, just to show it. And uh, the reason I'm showing this is just to sh illustrate that the duration of this set squared pulse the duration of it is proportional to the dephasing time of the Raman, the loss in the fiber, which can be very small, and the gain, the Raman gain, which can be very large in this case. So this can be a very small term, which means that uh, we, can, we, can, we can get a, a pulse duration which is much shorter than the coherence time. Another interesting thing you see is that you, you see this, 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 uh, this illusion of superluminal behavior. Um, once again, this is a space-time plot. Again, this, this time it's theory, and we're sending in, first of all, a set squared, uh, pul uh, squared pulse, uh, that should be seed pulse actually, coming in from the right, encounters the pump pulse, and gets amplified. And you'll notice that, that uh, you know, if, if everything was working right and, and the light was moving at the correct speed, the seed pulse would not, would not actually would stay where it was. It would get amplified, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't speed up. But what we're seeing here is that it's going faster than light. It shouldn't really be able to get there that quickly. Uh, and what's happening here is that the leading edge of the pulse is being reshaped very, very strongly through this, this, this amplification mechanism. So you, you get the illusion that the pulse is going faster than the speed of light. It's not actually. Now, we can, we can prevent that by having a, 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 a seat pulse which has a much sharper leading edge. This is a fairly gentle leading edge. If we make one of the much sharper leading edge, it's a super Gaussian pulse coming in. Then, then this, this, uh, this apparent superluminal behavior basically is reduced very strongly. Um, uh, because the leading edge is, is, is so much sharper in this case, and here we, we no longer see this uh, superliminal behavior, really. <clears throat> so, lots of interesting... There's lots and lots of 
of things one can do with the system. It's such a nice system to explore the physics of Raman scattering. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, other types of nonlinear effects like self-focusing, or you can propagate long distances, preserve the dispersion. Very nice. So my final topic um, uh, is a shorter one. Um, it has to do with propelling matter with light. It's laser-driven motion. Uh, this is a team of a uh, smaller team led by Tim and Uzer. Um, he's a, been a postdoc in my group for quite some years. We've had some help from Carlos Lenz in, in Campinas in Brazil, and the other guys are the students in the group. Laser tweezers, of course, this is Arthur Ashkin's uh, wonderful idea from the early days of the laser. Uh, he recognized that one can trap a dielectric particle in a focused laser beam through a combination of uh, propulsive forces and trapping forces, which just happen to balance so that the particle will sit stationary just above the focus of the, of the, of the laser beam. Okay, you understand that, but then, then the question that, that I asked myself shortly after the holocore fiber uh, came along was uh, what, can, what, what would happen if we had a laser beam which did not diffract, where there was no diffraction, so then, then we clearly would not have a stable trapping position. Instead, we would have a constant acceleration of the particle. If the part once the particle is trapped in the beam, it will experience constant acceleration with the light hitting it. So you could use this as a kind of laser propulsion system uh, for, for small particles, um, which we're actually looking at at the moment. Um, in, a, in an evacuated core, you can actually get to very high speeds, it turns out. Okay. This, this is interest. This is possible, of course, if, because the mode in a hollow core photonic band gap PCF does not diffract, or indeed in a Kagome. So, we haven't done the, uh, the experiment with the evacuated core yet, but we have been doing a lot of work with liquid-filled uh, PCF. Um, this is a fiber which was designed to guide at... Um, when it was empty, it was designed to guide at a longer wavelength, at around one... Mic uh, at around one uh, so two microns, I suppose it would have been in this case. Um, but when you fill it with liquid, um, it guides at um, <coughs> the wavelength where we did the experiments, which is 1024, 1064 nanometers in this case. So hence we filled it with D2O because the absorption of water at that wavelength is very high. Now this takes a little bit of forethought. Uh, you can make the fibers, of course, but you do need to, you do need to take account of the fact that if, that if you change the refractive index of the core and all the, all the hollow channels in the, in, the, in, the, in the cladding, so every single region where there was air, you've replaced it with a liquid, then there's a scaling law which is very useful. This is published by Tim Burks back in 2004. A scaling law allows you to predict where the wavelength, uh, the guidance wavelength, will land up when you replace the air with with uh, with, with liquid of a certain refractive index. In this particular case, it's about half. So, if the air wavelength might be, might be two microns, and then the guidance would be then at half that, more or less. So this is our experiment. At one end of the fiber, we use two glass plates, and there's a pool uh, of liquid uh, covering the end of the fiber. And in that pool of liquid, there's a population of small particles. These are dielectric spheres. It's actually borosilicate glass with the, the dimensions of a, of a few microns in diameter. We use conventional optical tweezers to pick up a particle and then move it to the entrance of the fiber, and then as a propelling beam, we push the particle in. And we have various cameras for looking at what's going on. At the other end of the fiber, we want to control the flow rate of the liquid, so at the other end of the fiber, we have a pressure head. We have a cell full of, uh, just a reservoir full of liquid. We can change the pressure head, and uh, through the... Um, uh, through the, the simple fluid mechanics of the system, the relative number is very small. It's laminar flow. You can work out the flow rate of the liquid and adjust it. So here are some pictures. On the left, uh, you see, first of all, a particle being picked up um, over here with the laser tweezers moved to the middle and then moved up to the entrance uh, of the fiber, that little, little yellow dot, if you can see it. Yeah, it's more or less visible in the picture, is, is the particle. And then looking from the side with a much better microscope, this is the particle sitting there, held in place by the light, the tweezer light, and also the light coming in that's going to push it into the core, the launching light, and there's liquid flowing out continuously from the core, which causes the particle to slowly rotate in the microscope. I can't show you that, but that's what we saw in the experiment. And then increasing the, the, the power of the launch laser light, the particle goes into the core and moves along. We can measure its velocity. Um, this, is, this is about, it's moving at about 100 micrometers per second in this case. You can then and this is the thing I really wanted to see, you can actually balance the optical forces with the fluid forces and keep the particle stationary. This is a, just a 
plot of the amount of power you need to balance a certain amount of flow of the liquid. So we can keep the particles.